Welcome to Bandit's Keep. I'm Daniel. This week we're going to talk about henchmen, hirelings, specialists, mercenaries, <laughs> all those different people that you can hire, how they might be used, and so on. This is a pretty common question I get from people who are coming into older games from other types of games, whether they be different genres of games or maybe a more modern version of Dungeons & Dragons. Also, we have a cool new sponsor this week. Zipaku, they make all kinds of cool battle maps. We're going to get into that in a little bit. Very, very fun stuff. But let's just kind of give us an overview here. Let you know what I'm going to talk about. I'd love to have any more comments and questions below as we go on this, because this is a pretty expansive topic. And the thing is, there's a lot of rules here, and this is where I'm going to go. I'm going to start with the basic expert set, which is what I always refer back to. It's a set that I learned on. It's also called BX or Molde Basic is one of the ways people talk about it. It's been cloned many times, most commonly or most popular right now, OSE. So if you're playing that game, that's what we're talking about. I like to dive back to the original version, though, because I think the language here is designed in a little bit more of a teaching way. So first of all, let's talk terms, because this is going to be important. People toss around a lot of terms interchangeably, and that's totally fine. But when we're talking about something, we want to lay things out. So I'm not saying that what I'm putting out here is the right way to call them, but it's what I'm going to call them for this particular video. So in the basic expert system, the people that you hire that you could think of as your right hand person, your lieutenant, the trusted friends and allies, those are called retainers here. In many systems, they'd be called your henchmen. So think of them as somebody close to you. And this number is limited by your charisma. So this is something that has a cap on it. You can only hire so many of these or kind of maintain them, right? Because you're paying them. But at the same time, they're kind of like your closest advisor, closest friend. I'm going to use hirelings a little differently. And we'll see they talk about them a little bit here. To me, a hireling is somebody who is a non-combatant that might go into the dungeon with you, such as a pack handler or a torch bearer. Then there are specialists. And again, this is just terminology I'm going to use. Specialists are people that don't go into the dungeon. They're more for, I would say, more closely related to domain play as far as hiring them on a regular basis. Those are your sages that you have on staff or alchemists, armorers. So that's maybe a little bit more uh, high level play. And then you've got mercenaries. So mercenaries are basically soldiers. They will not go into the dungeon. <laughs> they more or less are designed as protectors of your realm if, when you get to the higher levels. Or if you're going to make, let's say, a long outdoor trek, let's say four weeks to a dungeon, you might hire 15 horsemen to come with you to guard the party or help strengthen the party if you're attacked by a horde while you're on the road and also to, to you know guard the camp while you could delve into the dungeon. Those guys will not go into the dungeon. So they're handled slightly differently, and we're going to go kind of step by step through them, starting with retainers or henchmen, because I think these are the ones that have the most rules and the ones that are maybe going to be used the most by new players. First, though, I want to talk about our sponsor, Zepaku. This is a, a couple. They love sci-fi, and they show that love by making awesome battle maps. They've got planets, uh, spaceships, mechs, all kinds of fun stuff that you can put into your VTT or Myself, I mostly use them on my iPad. So on their Patreon, they put out three to four new maps a month, all kinds of variations on them. And at the $5 level, you get all that. There's a $10 tier too, where you get animated maps. And these are super cool if you want to run them in your VTT. If you're into sci-fi, if you're into using VTTs, or like me, you can throw them on your iPad and show your in-person group. Go ahead and check them out. I'll put a link in the description below. Okay, so I'm jumping into the basic book here. I'm on my iPad as usual. This is page B21. If you have this PDF, which you can pick up a drive through I'll put a link. Retainers. So again, I'm not going to read this, but effectively retainers are your, I'm going to call them henchmen here or retainers. Those are your close companions. Those are the ones that adventure with you. Oftentimes, though not always, these will be classed individuals. That is, they'll be fighters. They'll be thieves. They might be elves, although those are much more rare, or dwarves. Generally speaking, you're going to get clerics, magic users. These kind of individuals are used to strengthen the party and fill in gaps usually. So let's say that you're playing with a group of three players and somebody decides to play a thief and somebody plays a cleric and somebody plays a magic user. You might think to yourself, well, we want five or six party members to go down to this dungeon because, you know, it's going to be dangerous and we probably need some fighters. 
So you'll go out and look for leveled fighters to join the party. The way you hire them, it's a little vague in BX because it talks about offering money and putting out signs. If you roll back to od and they do give you kind of an idea there by saying about 100 gold pieces is what you want to offer them and a percentage of the take. Now, BX does it a little differently. It doesn't tell you how much you should offer them, but it does say that typically they'll want a half share, which is, I think, pretty common in how most people play. So we're going to lean that way. So let's say, for instance, you want to hire these three fighters. What you're going to do is you're going to be in town and you're going to either go, you could role play this out uh, or you could use it, do it procedurally with dice. You're going to go to the taverns. You're going to go to the rough side of town. You're going to go to where you think a fighter might be. Now, if it was a magic user you were looking for, you might go to the libraries or talk to the sages. Or if it was a cleric, you might go to the temples, right? You're going to go to the places where these people might be and you're going to basically make an offer. You're going to say, listen, we have we know about this dungeon. We know there's great treasures here. We can offer you 10 gold pieces a day plus a half share of treasure if you join our party. And this is now you're making this offer, right? And I'm just throwing that out there. Whatever you offer them, and again, depending on their level, they might be, they could even be zero level at this point. So what they call normal men in this system. And if that's the case, and again, they could be, let's say, a zero level cleric, if you want to think of it like that. This is not in the rules, but you just kind of think about it, right? If you go to a temple and somebody's trained to be a cleric, but they're zero level, well, once they get some experience points, they might become a first level cleric. As a zero level person, they're not going to be particularly useful, except for to swing a sword or a mace, as that would be. But, you know, you want to think that out depending on their level. And a note here should be that retainers or henchmen can never be a higher level than you. So if you're first level, you're hiring first level and zero level people. You No second level person is going to work for <laughs> the first level party. They might hire you, but they're not going to work for you. So once you have established how much you want to offer them, wh- how what their the deal will be, like how much gold they'll get, if there's any other bonuses, will you get any of the magic items? Then you, you know, you're going to make this offer. Then what you're going to do is there's a chart here. You literally just roll on it and the dungeon master will decide. They'll say, well, you offered them a little bit more than the going rate. Or they might say there's a bunch of adventuring parties in here looking for hirelings and or retainers or henchmen. It was it. And you are lowballing compared to everybody else. So you're going to get a penalty on the roll and your charisma can also affect the role. So you're going to want your party member with the highest charisma to usually make this offer. But remember <laughs> this is what's interesting. And I'm going to talk about how I do things that are a little different. The retainer works for the person who hires them. So you can't take your character with the six charisma and have your 17 charisma person go out and do all the hiring and have them work for the six charisma person. They're only going to work for the person that hires them in that sense. They are their retainer. And this is important to note. And again, we'll talk about some variations in how people do things as we go. You roll the dice. It's a simple 2d6 chart. Offer refused, and you get a bad reputation. Uh, offer refused, roll again. So that that you know assumes a little bit of like you're buying them ales or whatever. You're going to continue to talk. Maybe again at this point, if I got like a six, so the roll again is six, seven, eight. If you got a straight seven, I might just say, okay, what are you doing? Keep it really vague. If you got a six, I would probably tell the party, oh, you know, they're not really that interested, but they don't get up and leave yet. You know, and let them kind of sweeten the pot more. If you got an eight, you know, you think they might do it, but there's some hesitation, you know, so you're going to do this. Then they'll sweeten the pot or make another offer and you roll again. And again, you'll adjust the roll based on that. Now, once you get an, an offer accepted, this person now works for you and that's the deal, right? They go into the dungeon. I would not, as a DM, roll up anything more than how many they might be available in the town based on your town, right? Because there's no rules here for that because where are you hiring them? They can't really have rules for that. You got to kind of think about it. Where would there be people? Who are they trying to hire? It, would there be a lot of people around? Do they have a reputation, right? And if they're in some small town with 25 farmers, the likelihood of them getting a magic user or something like that is pretty slim, right? So you got to think like that. Now, assuming you've got a retainer or a henchman, they're going to work for the party. Let's talk about how they get their share of the treasure and how experience points work. Let's talk about their share and the experience. This is one of those places where the way things are written is a little bit funky and people do it differently. So I'm going to say what's here and then I'll give you my interpretation, but I'll even read it. Retainers will earn experience from adventures just like player characters do. 
and may rise in level in their character class once they have gained enough experience. Retainers, however, only receive half the experience PCs would receive because they were only following orders and not making decisions on their own. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm, this is this two parts, so I'm gonna break down that first part. Some people interpret that as they, you know, you, let's say you had a thousand experience points to divide between five people and one of them was a retainer. Everybody would get a fifth of the experience points, but the retainers would be penalized 50%. So that is to say a fifth would be 200. So everybody would get 200 experience points, including the retainer, but then they would only get 100. So it would be subtracted. That is to say, you wouldn't say, do what I do, which I'm going to talk about in a second, which is just give them a half share of experience points, like I give half share of treasure. This is actually what it says in OSE. So maybe that's a common interpretation. I know that Gavin did a lot of research. I don't do it that way because I feel like that pulls more experience points out of the party. And especially at low levels, that can be a little bit... Ugh, especially when you want to hire it, like in this case, if half your party is retainers. So I kind of don't do that personally. The way I do it is, let's say, the same situation. Uh, that party that I just talked about that was six people, I would actually treat as the three retainers as being basically a person and a half, you know, as far as for the experience points when you did your math. So there'd be four and a half people dividing the experience points. The PCs would each get theirs, and then that remainder part would be divided amongst the, the retainers. So hopefully that's clear. But this is the part that's interesting. Retainers may be awarded more than their agreed upon portion of treasure and thus gain more experience than normal. So what this makes me think, which is why I do it the way I do it, is retainers get experience points based on the gold they receive. That is their share of the gold, which means they are not penalized. They just don't get as much gold. So now you could do both things, give them only it based on their gold and have it, which I think would be really mean. But because of that sentence, I always do the opposite. So now let's go back. We have, a, let's say the thousand experience points is a thousand gold pieces. This retainer is getting a half a share, right? So when we look at it like that, the total number of shares, let's say you have, again, four PCs and one retainer, the total number of shares there would be four and a half, right? So you would divide it out that way. There's lots of ways to do the math, but effectively what you're going to do is that retainer would get like their like 110-ish gold pieces, and that would be their experience points. But the rest of the party would be getting like 220 each or something like that. So they wouldn't get, uh, you know, they wouldn't lose that extra 20 or whatever it would be in this case. And that might seem like a small amount, but over time it adds up. So that's how I do it. And that's based on this second line and just always how I've done it. And I've seen a lot of people do it this way. So you could do it either way. You could either give it to them based on the gold you give them, thus their share, thus it doesn't take away from the party, or you could give it to them based on an equal amount of adventuring and then divide it. Now, if you're talking about monsters, maybe that first way is the right way to do it, but I find that's just way too much math. So <laughs> I just do all the experience points the way I just described. They just get a half a share of all. Hopefully that's clear because that is one of the biggest sticking points. The second biggest sticking point is how do you make these retainers and what's their loyalty? Okay, so when we go back to our hiring process, what I would do normally is I, would, I wouldn't even bother creating much of a personality unless you're just a person that loves role-playing that stuff out. I would just say three fighters show up for the job. One of them is you know, this, one of them is that, one of them is this. What I probably do is just roll their strength because that's the most important attribute for a fighter. So I might say a big burly, uh, you know, woman comes in, a small kind of thin man and, you know, an average build, middle, middle 30s guy, you know, whatever. And then they would be like, okay, cool. And they'd have an idea, right? So the, the big burly woman, it probably has the higher strength. So she might be the better fighter. So they might want to give her the the, the better offer, right? And that's all I'd give them up front. You don't need to tell the players what the NPC's scores are or anything like that. And I wouldn't bother rolling up all the other stuff for them. It is incredibly unlikely that somehow they're going to need their intelligence score or their wisdom or their charisma or how much gold they have or, you know, or their hit points in that first interaction. But once they are hired by the party, then you create them just like you create a regular player character. You just sit down, roll 3d6 down the line. I mean, you've already rolled their attribute that was important, right? So you roll <laughs> the rest down the line and then that's it. You just make them. I generally will just use the starting gold uh, as well for these guys if they are first level. 
if they're second level, because you're hiring maybe somebody a little bit higher, I might just give them equipment that I think is a most second level characters would have. And if they're zero level, I probably would just give them a weapon and no armor, you know, and just make the player characters have to outfit them if they choose to do that. That's just the simplest way to do it. Again, that's not in the rules, but it makes sense for me that way. So the final kind of part here, well, semi-final, part, the, the uh, final part that's like has rules for it is the loyalty. So in BX, we have a morale score. Now, the morale score of retainers or henchmen, the people we're talking about right now, is determined by the charisma of the person that hired them and brought them into the group. This is their base number. Now, if you did roll a 12 on the hiring, it actually goes up by one immediately. Then you will, as a dungeon master, adjust their morale over time based on how they are treated. What happens? Let's say the party hires three fighters. They go in and they, they're they strong and they, they, they do their best to, to you know, do their job in the party. And two of them get killed and the third one survives. But then they just get their regular share of treasure and the party doesn't really think much about it. That would probably be a penalty to me in the morale, even though you didn't necessarily treat them badly. You gave them what you promised. This is a situation where two of the other, two or three people died. They know it's dangerous, right? You're going to want to sweeten the pot, you know? So I definitely would think of that. So adjust their morale. I, I don't do it every single time the party makes an action. I think about the overall adventure and how it went. Then BX recommends at the end of the adventure, you make a morale check. Right. So again, this is that new adjusted morale. Yes. Yeah, so let's say that your 17 <laughs> charisma person hired somebody. So they have a nine morale and you got the bonuses and you've got a plus one. So they've got a 10 morale. So throughout the adventure, they are treated well. They're not just told to hold the line where the party runs. You know, they're actually fought with, tre- treated like a comrade. They're given a fair share of treasure, maybe even a little extra. So we say, okay, their morale stays the same or maybe goes up one. As soon as you get back to town, you roll again. Now, when you're making a morale score, you basically have to roll under. So if their morale is 10 and you're rolling 2d6, they're probably going to stick with you. But if their morale is 10 and you roll a 12, right, they leave. Now, now again, if it wasn't a bad experience, you can justify that as maybe they just had enough. Maybe there was something going on in their life. You can make a note that this person isn't, isn't like negative towards the party. They just need to leave. They can't, they can't stay, right? And the longer somebody stays with the party and the better they're treated, I would work their morale up, 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 up. It should never be more than 11 because you have to roll under, I should say you have to roll over the morale to, uh, you know, to leave. So obviously if it's 12, they would never leave. I don't think I'd ever make anybody's morale 12. That would be, you know, that would be somebody who's charmed or like undead. Like those people have 12 morale. So if you call undead people, well, it could be undead animals, I suppose. My point there is that you, the party should be, so this is for the players, you should be trying to treat your henchmen well so they stay and they want to be there. Because the last thing you want is to be in the deep, dark depths of a dungeon and have your henchmen take off when you need them the most. You want them to drag you out when you're, you know, when you're beat up and broken leg or whatever happens to you. You want them to drag your body that's turned to stone out and figure out a way to get you brought back because they are loyal and your friend. You want them to do that. And in order to do that, you got to treat them well. Okay, let's talk personalities. So again, there's no rules in BX for this, but there's tons of websites where you can roll up random personalities, bunches of books you can get. I tend to keep my NPC retainers as neutral as possible. That is, I don't give them a big flamboyant personality. I like to have them sit back. The reason for that is, number one, they're getting that half XP, right? So it says they're supposed to be like following orders, right? They're, they're kind of with the group going, okay, what's the group doing? I'll do what needs to happen. They're not up there making decisions. That's not their place or their job. So because of that, you don't need to give them this big personality. But you do want to give them enough of a personality so the party doesn't think of them as, and I hate this term, meat shields. Because a party that does that will quickly get a bad reputation and never get more retainers. So that's a bad thing, but also it's just like, why would they stay with you if you treat them like that? But if they're blank, if they're just a a cardboard cutout, the party can't treat them well because they won't know much about them. So give them a little bit of personality, infuse them what seems to make sense. Now, as far as personality and decisions and morale, I think that that's the area that the, the DM needs to 
take control of the NPC. That is to say that they should decide that, right? They they know what the personality is of the retainer. You don't let the players make it up. You could do that, but I typically don't do that. But mechanically, I usually just let the players operate the NPC retainers. That is to say, if you hire a fighter, let's say you're a magic user, and you hire a fighter to protect you, well, when combat starts, you basically be like, Brutus, uh, you know, move forward with your pole arm and, and take out those goblins before they get to us. And then assuming they have a good relationship, Brutus will do such a thing, which means that I don't need to then roll Brutus myself. I'll just let the magic user do it. You know, just, okay, roll for Brutus. It's not a big deal. But if they say, Brutus, go jump in front of that red dragon and, you know, block me with your body so I don't get dragon breath on me. Yeah, Brutus probably isn't going to do that. And that's when you need to jump in. So I think the general rule is let the players run them in the sense that they tell them what to do and the retainers will usually be okay with it as long as it's not outrageous and it's a normal thing. For instance, let's go back and think of our original party. If we've got a fighter, a magic user, and a cleric who hire a thief, well, that thief knows they're going to need to pick the locks and stuff. So they're not going to be like, oh, you make me pick locks and now I'm going to fail my morale check. I mean, that's their job, right? They're there to pick the locks. That is what a henchman slash retainer is for. They are not there to take all the risk, though. They're not there to always scout ahead by themselves, but they will do things like that. And you've got to play that by ear. Let the players kind of tell them what to do or give them, you know, direction. And if it seems weird or off, make a morale check. Because morale doesn't necessarily mean they run out of the dungeon. It could just mean like they say, you know, I that's I'm not going to scout ahead. We did last time I scouted ahead, we four orcs and I barely got away from them before they killed me. I think we need to stay close together. This is a dangerous place. I'm not going to do it. You know, that's just the way you got to do it, right? Because players, especially players new to henchmen or new to the game, will try to send the henchmen forward to just be, you know, bait. And you got to make sure that you treat these henchmen like they are real people. And again, henchmen equal retainer. And I mentioned that again, because I'm going to briefly, because I think we're getting a little long here, talk about the second part of this. In the expert book, we talk about specialists and mercenaries. And if you may have noticed that I mentioned earlier about pack bearers and torch bearers, and I really didn't mention that again, because there's not really rules for that. Now, what you could do is say, okay, if you, I hire a zero level normal human, I'll just hire them as that and treat them exactly like a normal retainer and then let them level up. And then once they get some levels, they stop being the torch bearer and then they can be one of your man at arms. You could do it that way. And that totally works. I often like to have what I call non-combatants, and I'm going to talk about that and how I use these rules from Expert to do that. Specialists are pretty simple. you got your alchemists, your armorers, your animal trainers. And by the way, this book specifically talks about training hippogriffs as mounts. So if you for some reason think that all old school games are low magic or low fantasy, I think this says a little bit different, but that's a little insert here. Anyways, this is that those guys, right? You want to build a castle, you hire an engineer. I'm not really going to go over that. I think that's pretty straightforward. I guess if there's questions about that, let me know in the comments. But let's talk about mercenaries. I think the area of mercenaries is where players might try to take advantage when they look at it, if they don't read it deeply enough. They're looking at this and they're going, oh man, I get a heavy foot. So if a man with a chain, shield, and sword and just pay him three gold pieces a month, heck yeah. No, 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 no. <laughs> that's for when you're hiring an army. This is not somebody who goes into the dungeon with you. And it does specifically say here that if it's a dangerous situation, the amounts should be more. doesn't really give you an exact number, but it tells you more. So again, I'll talk about how I do this. So let's talk about three things here. I don't know why I did this because that's way more than three. Let's talk about three things here. Number one, morale. With mercenaries, their morale is based on what type of mercenary they are, not on the person that hired them. So if you have a lower high charisma, you can definitely add the bonus or take the penalty to this, but their base morale is based on who they are. That is to say, a peasant is a six morale, a man-at-arms or Viking raider has an eight. doesn't matter if you have a 10 charisma or a 16, except that you'll modify their role for morale if they have to make it. So that's number one. Number two, if you want to hire them, because I often will do this, 
as groups of people to protect bands of adventurers while they travel outside. So that kind of goes out of the purview of what it kind of explains here. But if I want to hire, like I said in the beginning, 15 horsemen to travel with the party to the dungeon and set up a camp above and kind of guard it, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at this rule here that says, for hazardous duty, cost is double. The cost should be much higher if the DM permits mercenaries to go on adventures with the player characters. How much is left to the DM? So how do I do this? Quite frankly, to keep it simple, what I do is I say the cost per month becomes cost per day. So that heavy foot is three gold pieces per day to travel with you. If it is dangerous, it'll be six gold pieces per day, which still is not a tremendous amount of money for what they're doing when you think about it. But you also need to outfit them. So it's not going to be prohibitively expensive to hire 15 riders to travel with the party if they if they're at a level that they've or going that distance and they feel like they'd need to. But at the same time, they need to provide everything for them. And this is based on the idea that this is not a combat situation, more like we're showing a force of arms and guarding the, the camp. If something goes down and they have to fight, they're going to want double pay. So keep that in mind. And a smart player character will always actually pay more. I keep pointing out the three gold pieces here for this heavy footman, but actually what we're talking about before is horses, right? So let's look at some real numbers here. If you were to take 15 horsemen with you for, let's say, a month in the woods, you're talking about 15 per day, right, times 15, and then, I guess, times 30, right? So that's like, I don't know, five, 6,000 or something like that. I'm not going to do the math right here in the video, but it, it's several thousand gold pieces to take these 15 guys with you. So, And that's assuming that they're not going into combat. So it's worth it on some level if you go into a dungeon where you're going to start pulling tens of thousands of gold pieces but it's definitely not something that a party is going to do if they're thinking they're going to pull a handful of gold out of a cave that's nearby, right? So again, mercenaries should be used specifically for those kind of things. And I do it quite often, so it's pretty cool. It's actually a fun way to do it. You can also obviously hire only a couple to guard the camp because, you know, when the party delves into a mega dungeon, if they're there for multiple days, you're going to want to set up a camp. And this is the final thing I'm going to add, which again is a home type rule. If we look over here under the mercenary troop type, we see non-fighter peasant. This to me is the pack bearer. This to me is the torch bearer. They are one gold piece per day if we bring them on to adventures, but double that if they go into the dungeon, right? So basically you're looking at two gold pieces a day to go into the dungeon. They do not fight. So they're not going to bear weapons. I guess they might pick up a weapon and defend themselves if they... Uh, isn't there an adventure based on that where the whole party gets killed and you play uh, characters that are trying to get out of the dungeon? But anyways, you know, basically these people do not fight. They stay in the back. They carry the packs. They watch your camp. They cook your food. That's what I do for, the, for this. So if you're going to hire people and you want a base price line, that's what I would do. At home, when you're in your camp, you don't have to pay them very much at all. You're just basically supporting them. If they go out in the woods with you, you're paying them quite a bit. And that peasant... You might say, well, why would a peasant do that? It's so risky. But, you know, that peasant could get 60 gold pieces by going out with you for a month. That could be a year or more pay in, in this world, right? So, and maybe they learn something and become an adventurer after that. So this is why they might do it. I would love to know how you use henchmen. There's so many different ways to do it. What I would definitely say is simpler is better. I don't think you need to get super complex with them. Don't make them characters that become, that overshadow the PCs but make them characters the PCs like. And they will, the PCs will, players really, will start to latch on to certain NPCs usually because something happens, right? They do a really, they have a really good role or they do a, one thing that helps somebody or whatever. And now all of a sudden that's, that, that's the friend of the party and they start giving them better weapons. And, and it really does build a story around it naturally. You don't need to force it. It's there. They're not faceless, nameless meat shields, but they're not the people up front. What I always think of is if you watch these old movies where like, let's say Clash of the Titans would be a good one, where they go off to, to get Medusa's head and there's a bunch of guys with Perseus, right? And most of them get killed, but like they're not all named, but they're there. You know, you see them. They they sometimes do different personalities, sometimes there's little conversations, but only really the main lieutenant people actually show up. The other guys are kind of background extra until they're needed. And that's how I treat most henchmen and retainers and definitely treat your mercenaries and your hirelings. So let me know what you think about this. Check out the description below. You're going to find a link to our sponsor, Zipaku. Awesome maps. Check them out. Very, very cool. You'll also find a link to my Discord server. Jump on over there. Let's start a conversation. And of course, my Patreon's down there as well. If you want to support the channels, I appreciate that. And I'll talk to you soon.